Hello, everyone. One of the biggest challenges in Ukraine continues to be the systematic bombing of civilians and uh, shelling and drone attacks. <clears throat> I just talked to my parents like an hour ago, and um, for them, if there are no big explosions, that's considered to be a quiet week at this point. Apparently, there's been another massive attack against Kiev. Um, fortunately, no significant damage and no casualties. That, of course, is the most important thing. Um, and so far, Ukrainian air defense systems are managing to destroy majority of the drones. But as we talked about in the past, the problem is that when a drone is destroyed or when a missile is destroyed, it's not des destroyed 100%. It's not just like evaporated into nothing. There are pieces of them left and um, those pieces can still cause destruction and can still cause casualties. So that continues to be a challenge. There was a reason why... Uh, President Zelensky put air defense systems at the top of his priority list when, when asked, you know, what would be like his biggest wish right now. He has a very good reason for that. Other areas of Ukraine outside of Kiev weren't so lucky. Uh, we had um, casualties in the Kharkiv uh, region. Uh, we had casualties in Nikopol. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's it's almost hard to feel relief, you know, when you're reading this and, you know, it's not your region that got hit. You know, it's not your parents, not your friends, former classmates, former teachers, because you can't feel relief at this. You really can't because somebody somewhere did get killed. And the whole thing is just a big game of Russian roulette, literally. More bad news. Uh, Ukrainians had to pull out of another village in the east, in the Donetsk region, uh, because Russians destroyed all of the uh, defensive lines there. Now, Ukrainians have used the strategy before, basically put up a bunch of defenses slow them down and eliminate as many as possible and then pull out. So it's not necessarily all bad, but I'm sure for people living in those border villages and towns, this is incredibly difficult. And I sincerely hope that uh, Ukraine's authorities are doing everything they can to get people the hell out of there before anything big starts in the area. Because we know Russians are ruthless. We already know this. We've seen it. We've seen it all at this point. So I, I really hope they're not waiting. Now this I didn't know about. This was something that my parents told me about. Uh, the assassination of a former Ukrainian lawmaker who was also an advocate of Ukrainian as the primary language. So what is this all about? Now, what, what is this all about in terms of the issues of language? Uh, as I mentioned in the past, when I was growing up in Ukraine, it was still part of the Soviet Union. Even though, theoretically, all of the Soviet republics were supposed to be equal, that was not true. Russia was the dominant republic. It dictated all of the policy, all of the education programs. Uh, all of that came out of Moscow. All right? Russian was the official state language of the Soviet Union and all of the republics. And while um, 
the republics did study their own languages at school, those were treated as secondary. So after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the republics were faced with the difficult choice because some of the children were still at school. I was one of them. And they had to figure out how we're going to handle this. Fortunately, most kids in the former Soviet republics already spoke the language of the republic. So by the time the Soviet Union was dissolved, I already spoke Ukrainian, as did my classmates. So switching to Ukrainian as the state language wasn't that big a deal. More problematic would have been the switch for the various uh, companies, various government offices, etc., etc. So this particular person, Irina Farion, uh, was a professional linguist. She was the uh, professor of philology um, and an advocate of Ukrainian language. So she was basically uh, fighting to make Ukrainian language Ukraine's state language before it was cool. And so she uh, was assassinated in Lviv. Several things about that. First of all, uh, initially she survived the, the assault, but she died of her wounds in the hospital. And also Lviv is far to the west of Ukraine. And so whoever carried this out had to basically travel the entirety of Ukraine to get there. Um, it is unknown at this time who this person is. We don't know who did it. Um, and while I personally have a lot of disagreements uh, with the uh, Ukrainian nationalists, we do have some extremists, um, I don't disagree about the language. Russian language is still used commonly, you know, when we're talking about just talking in the streets, talking amongst yourself. I talk to my parents in, in Russian. That is our preferred language. Nobody persecutes anybody for that. It's just that when it comes to official papers, education, etc., uh, people use Ukrainian. And this is not at all uncommon. This happens in a lot of countries that have multiple languages and dialects. So, so this is definitely a developing story. We'll see what Ukrainian security services uncover. And if the news about Ukraine today feel like basically a one gigantic story of struggle, it's because it is. And this particular article in Reuters talks about why. Now, I've been saying this for so long now, that all of, <clears throat> all of this attention, all of the activity we're seeing now, finally, all of this help is 10 years too late. For 10 years, Ukraine, after the annexation of Crimea, after the Orange Revolution, has been begging for protection, which incidentally NATO had promised it after the dissolution of Soviet Union. For 10 years, Ukraine has been saying, we cannot hold this line anymore. We can't do this alone. You have to help us. But it all fell on deaf ears and continued so, not even when the passenger airplane carrying a bunch of foreign nationals had been hit. So this article provides a really good analysis of where NATO, EU, and US collectively have seriously missed the boat and how everything that's happening right now, the full-scale invasion, could in fact have been prevented had people taken what was going on in Ukraine seriously 10 years ago.